Our next uh, speaker um, is Dr. Fred Moslem. Um, he has an MD and PhD from uh, Case Reserve University. He is an uh, interventional radiologist. He, he did his diagnostic radiology residency at Cleveland Clinic and then interventional radiology at the University of Maryland. Uh, he has extensive experience in hepatic uh, neoplasms and uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, please welcome Dr. Fred. Right behind you, snuck up. Thank you. <laughs> Clearly, um, your surgeons are taller than us radiologists. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell, uh, you know, Joe and Steve, you're, you're much kinder than my, my surgeons because my surgeons always make me do this right after lunch. So uh, I'm always fighting the postprandial uh, snooze. So if you fall asleep, I guess I'm going to have to admit I'm boring. Uh, at least, at least at home, I can just say they were they, they were napping because dinner was too good. Um, this is a pleasure, uh, you know, uh, being able to, to to talk in front of a, a you know a, 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 um, you know, a diverse group uh, of people such as this, you know, not just radiologists. Uh, you know, really is a, is a great opportunity. Um, There we go. A couple of disclosures. One is relevant. I, I, obviously, I, I speak in, uh, on behalf of Surtex. Uh, but I will say uh, uh, every, everything that I talk about today uh, in, with regards to uh, Y90 is actually published uh, data. Uh, and uh, anything that I talk about um, uh, with uh, SurSphere's that doesn't include uh, metastatic colorectal is, is off-label. So really, I, I just want to give a, a brief refresher on, on where we stand with the metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, and then I'd like to sort of dive into what CERT is. You know, I'm hoping that everyone in this room uh, not only knows what it is, but is actually has embraced it and is trying to use it uh, within their practice. Uh, but if not, maybe uh, we'll plant some seeds today. Um, and then, uh, yeah, no pun intended. Um, uh, and then, uh, well, I'd really like to, uh, to hone in at the end really on uh, the evidence for where we should be timing radiomalization, not just that we should be using it, but when and, and, and in what patients. So, you know, this is sort of where we stand. Now, this is a slightly dated slide. It's from about 2008, but the numbers really haven't changed much. Um, even with, uh, uh, you know, a better and earlier surveillance, we're still catching about 40% of the patients at stage 1 and 2 disease and another 40% at stage 3 disease. And unfortunately, you know, still almost 20% of patients, you know, appear uh, with, at presentation, stage 4 disease. Now for, uh, you know, most of these patients, that's either liver only um, or liver dominant uh, metastatic disease. Uh, obviously for, for low rectal cancers, it's 50-50 between lung and, and liver. The reason that matters is all, everyone in this room is aware, um, if you're unfortunate enough to present with stage 4 disease or if you present later uh, with, uh, you know, down the road stage 4 disease, your survival plummets. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, that we haven't really been able to do uh, despite, you know, 40 years of chemotherapy uh, advances um, is really crack, you know, the, this nut. I mean, there are, there are a few patients that, that respond to chemotherapy and do have these five-year survivals, but really the only way uh, to, to really uh, provide a five-year survival for any of these patients um, is, is to get them to surgery. Um, and, and again, this just demonstrates that, you know, you know, back in the late 50s, if you were diagnosed with stage 4 disease, you had just about enough time, uh, you know, to get your will together, visit the beach one last time um, before they put you six feet under. The addition of 5-FU, which still remains the mainstay of therapy, um, you know, has provided the single largest, uh, you know, survival benefit for these patients. Um, in, in the last you know, 50 years. And they, over the last three decades, we've seen, and this list is nowhere near complete, uh, we've seen the addition of many new, uh, both biologics as well as chemotherapeutics, uh, and yet we're still seeing, oops, we're still seeing, um, let me see if I can make, come on. We're, st we're still seeing that, you know, we're, we're really plateauing here. Um, and, and, you know, at our institution, if you don't get the resection, we, you know, we're looking at, you know, somewhere between 22 and 24 months uh, of survival for these patients, you know, with extensive chemotherapy uh, and oftentimes a lot of toxicities. So, you know, the real question, you know, that, that has to be asked is there, is there another way to battle this? And one of the things we can make use of is the fact that, you know, most of these tumors, uh, well, not most, all tumors have their own neovascularity. 
uh, which we can we make, make use of. So even in the setting of colorectal cancer, which is notorious for being a hypovascular tumor, it's really hypervascular relative to the surrounding liver. And so we can, we can play on that. So the, the reality is, is that surrounding a, a colorectal cancer, there's between three and five times greater concentration of arteries and veins than in the surrounding liver. So it works as a natural sump. And as all of you guys know, most interventional radiologists are inherently lazy. It's not that we're lazy, we just have such short attention spans, we can't concentrate that long. So CERT works very well from the standpoint that we don't have to get up close and personal to all these tumors. We can get into the, you know, the proximal feeding vessel and then allow blood flow to deliver uh, the particles where they're going. Now that's, that's slightly different um, uh, uh, theoretical delivery mechanism between glass and resin, uh, but uh, you know, the, you know, when using resin, uh, it, essentially these particles are, are light and they float and they are appropriately sized so they really fit into the, the neovascular area around these tumors. Uh, the CERT particles have embedded in them yttrium, which is a pure beta emitter, and the nice thing about that, uh, that uh, emitter is the fact that it has a very short half-life and has a very short kill zone. So this allows for great specificity in what we're, what we're targeting. Uh, the, the, the lethal zone is about four millimeters in radius, so almost a centimeter around each particle. Another common question that comes up is, well, my patient's on chemotherapy and I don't want to take them off. Uh, why, you know, what are we going to do about this radiation? And, and, and the very cavalier answer, and I think actually the, the appropriate answer, is, well, don't take them off. Uh, leave them on. At, at University of Maryland, you know, we actually prefer to treat our patients while they're actively undergoing chemotherapy. Uh, we get, we've seen in-house much better results in patients that are on chemotherapy. I think it's due to the radiosensitizing effect uh, of the chemotherapy, um, and we've also not seen uh, toxicities. Now, it's recommended to dose reduce oxaliplatin by about 30%, but I'll tell you that unless you're treating patients first line, uh, naive colorectal cancer patients first line with Y90, and if you are, I'd like to know how you're getting it paid for, because uh, I'd like to do it too. Um, but the, the, the reality is, is that if your patients have already seen oxaliplatin and are five or six cycles in, we have not seen any increase uh, in, in neuropathy uh, with the addition of, uh, of the radioembolization. So we don't dose reduce our oxaliplatin pros, so to speak. Um, for things like arena TCAN, there's absolutely no cross-reactivity, so there's no concerns whatsoever. And the reason we hold bevacizumab, as you're all well aware, I mean, clearly in this room you guys know the toxicities of bevacizumab, really that's about me being able to get the catheter where it belongs. Uh, so you know, at Maryland, I actually hold uh, for six weeks, and we tend in our, in our Avastin patients to do whole liver therapies so that immediately after treatment we can put the patient back on Avastin. Uh, so at Maryland, they, they tend to be only held for two months. Uh, so it's six weeks before I map, two weeks later we do the whole liver, you know, the day after they go back on Avastin. Um, the, the thing I would recommend, though, if, you're, if you are treating patients that do seem to be Avastin dependent, make sure you restage those patients immediately before the therapy, because these patients will escape. Uh, it is very clear that uh, while Avastin is uh, is difficult for us to, to, to manage. Uh, it, 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 it does a really good job at keeping a lot of these tumors in check. And when you break it, even for six weeks, uh, these tumors really increase in size. Um, uh, and you want to make sure you have a new baseline. Gemcitabine doesn't play a role for colorectal cancer. I simply throw it in. Um, if you're treating things other than colorectal cancer, you know, like at our institution, uh, you know, stage four pancreatic cancer and some head and neck cancers, you really want them off the gemcitabine for at least four weeks ahead of time because of, uh, the, the gemcitabine is a really potent radiosensitizer and, it, and, and it, in this case it actually makes the liver way too prone for bystander injury. Um, and then again at Maryland we actually we double all this. It's, two weeks, it's, it's, it's four weeks ahead of time and, and four weeks after. The official recommendations from SIR are one week and two weeks. I think that's an under, I think that's, that, that's not generous enough. The other thing I, you know, I want to point out is that this procedure is a true outpatient procedure. It usually takes three therapies, uh, a mapping procedure, uh, which is just a diagnostic procedure, um, and then the two uh, radio, uh, radio embolizations. Patients are in and out the same day. There is no reason for them to stay. Of the nearly 500 administrations that I've done in my, uh, my career, um, there's uh, I, two stayed, and both of those were patients that had pain, and they had pain before we treated them, and uh, you know we needed to help them afterwards. You know, the average recovery really is fatigue, and the fatigue's at the level of, of flu-like symptoms. 
um, anorexia and fever. So this is extremely well tolerated. Uh, gastritis, I think, is higher than 25%. My own practice, I believe, it's much higher than 25%. The gastritis is not because the particles get there. This is a stress response. Uh, the patients we treat with Prevacid uh, really manage that very well. Uh, with appropriate angiographic skill, the risk of ulcers should be less than 1%. Now, the, the published accepted rate is 7%, uh, but that's, that's absurdly high. Uh, you, really, you really want to be working with an interventional radiologist who's taking the care and making sure that uh, these particles are staying where they belong. And, and, and you know, at our institution, we're, we're a little under 1% ulcer rate. The other thing to say about the ulcers, too, is we have yet to see a perforation. Uh, so even though we have, uh, have ulcers into the tune of about one per year, we've never seen perforation. So that's another one of the fears that's out there with this, uh, with this therapy, is that you'll, you'll get spheres into the stomach or in the duodenum and get a perforation. Um, that's just not very common at all. Uh, usually medical management is all that needs to be, take, uh, to be done to manage the ulcers. Um, then the other thing that, we, you know, that I really want to emphasize here is appropriate follow-up. You know, the radiation kills slowly. This is like a slow motion crash. So don't expect at, at four weeks that everything that we treated is going to disappear. Especially with colorectal cancer, uh, most colorectal mets, when they die, turn into scars. So the liver actually looks worse when I'm done um, than, than when I started. Uh, but, you know, again, ugly is beautiful. So I would actually argue, and this paper would support that, that the best way to follow these patients is with PET at about six to eight weeks, because it does two things. It tells me how I did, but it also tells us how the patient's probably going to do um, down the road. And this is the problem that we face, and this is what I was talking about by ugly. You can see here, this is a, this is a pretreatment patient, right? And anyone in the room can see there's some tumors there. But most people would walk into the room and say, my God, Fred, what did you do? Um, you know, the patient was fine until I sent him to you. So I would walk into the room and I'd, I'd be trying to break my, my arm, pat myself on the back, because it's clear that we've had a great effect here. Right? So this is where contrast-enhanced CT is, is, is misleading, because these tumors, when they die, become much more hypovascular and become, uh, become much easier to see. What you don't realize is that a lot of these tumors are isodense to the liver, and they just don't show up very well. But that goes away. Oh, come on. That goes away when you use PET. It doesn't take a rocket scientist um, or even a radiologist um, you know, to say that this guy's got a lot of disease. But this is the same patient. This is the same set of images from the PET CT. You can see this was a really excellent uh, you know, a near complete response uh, to, to radioembolization. You know, this is what we want. Now, and the other kicker from this, come on, the other kicker from this, I'm going to skip through this, uh, is that this provides predictive value. So if we look at patients that have had a partial response by WHO criteria, and that means uh, a reduction in their SUV by greater than 30 percent, at six weeks, if you look at, uh, at their outcomes, those patients have a lasting response out past 12 months to the radioembolization. Whereas patients that did not have at least a partial response by, by SUV um, criteria uh, end, you know, ended up with uh, a much shorter response. And uh, where we're using that at Maryland, when I can get the PET CTs, because uh, un uh, unfortunately we're fighting, uh, we're fighting an uphill battle and getting them paid for, um, but when we can use the PET CTs for colorectal cancer, we have no data for other tumor types. But for colorectal cancer, when we see a patient that has failed uh, the, the CERT, and unfortunately, you know, CERT doesn't work in everybody, then we recommend coming back with uh, a, a debris um, or changing up the chemotherapeutic regimen uh, in an aggressive fashion to try and salvage these patients, because we know they're going to fail sooner. Um, all right, so that's, that's well and good, but do we have evidence that, uh, that this stuff works? So uh, Hendelise's data, I think, really um, is the, uh, was, was the first uh, trial really uh, well-powered looking at this. Uh, and essentially what Hendelise did was took salvage patients, deep salvage patients. These were all patients that had failed at least three or four lines of chemotherapy. Um, and based on the NCCN guidelines, uh, you know, uh, put them into one of two arms, either protracted 5-FU infusion with the ability to cross over progression, um, or immediate Y90 uh, treatment uh, plus 5-FU protracted infusion. 
And what you can see here is that the, the white and pink line basically demonstrates that in all patients that had 5-FU, they all progressed, they all progressed quicker than in, in the experimental arm, um, and they did so all in the liver. So it was the liver um, that was the, the bugaboo. And that fits with, you know, our data from the early, uh, you know, to, uh, the early 1980s, which showed in path, uh, you know, in uh, uh, path studies uh, that really what killed patients with uh, metastatic colorectal cancer is, is, was liver failure. Um, oops. And if you, if you also look, you'll see, um, you'll, you'll see that in, the, in patients that were treated with Y90, um, they all had a progression, they all had a shift to the right as far as, 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 far as um, their, their, uh, their, their um, um, survival. Um, just scratch ahead here a little bit. I can't get my kid to do this. This is a Google. Um, I, uh, I've asked him. You know, he's, mine's just as cute as this, but he just, he just won't, he won't play along. So the real question is, where, where do we go? Um, how, how do we integrate this into our therapy? Um, and so if you look at these two retrospective analyses versus uh, con uh, controls, you can see that you know, Kennedy's, Kennedy's study and, uh, and our study uh, uh, and Jacob's study, you know, basically showed that you know there's a there's a 10 uh, 10 month uh, survival advantage. If you um, come on, if you add in uh, Cosmelli, which is a which is a prospective trial, uh, he had 13 month survival in in patients that were in deep salvage. Um, and mo most recently, we were part of the Moore study, and essentially, we, with 600 patients, uh, we replicated this, uh, the, the same finding, and that is that, you know, essentially around a 10-month survival. The other thing that's, you know, there's a test on this one later, um, so make sure you get all that written down. Um, really, the point of that slide is that despite the fact we treated 600 patients at uh, almost 15 different centers uh, with innumerable different operators, uh, the, there were really very few grade three or above uh, complications. And the other thing I want to point out is that um, we had patients treated as many as five times uh, with, uh, uh, with Y90. So I'm going to skip through this for time purposes and Cosmeter for time purposes. And I, I want to uh, basically talk about the, you know, so where do we fit this in, uh, you know, into our, 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 our treatment paradigm? And I think really what we have to start thinking about is the fact that all the data to this point really has led us to the conclusion that the earlier that we uh, integrate Y90, uh, the more bang we get for our buck. You know, so it was, you know, talking about the expense of health care. You know, we're going to spend $80,000 to, uh, to do a Y90 therapy on a patient. Um, if you do it after four or five cycle or four or five lines of chemotherapy, you're getting between four and eight months of survival advantage in many of these patients. If you're doing it at the first, end of first line or early second line, you're getting between 12 and 16 months in many of those patients, or potentially longer because you may be getting them downstage to surgery. Um, the Surflox trial is a well-powered multinational trial looking essentially at first line naive patients. Uh, it has fully accrued and will actually get our results uh, this, this fall, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be, made, uh, they'll be published by uh, by January, and essentially what we're looking at in here is does Y90 up front uh, add to the survival advantage. Now this is, um, overall survival is, is a secondary endpoint, so we won't, we only get progression-free survival uh, first. So the last thing I want to point out, uh, you know, again, is, uh, is objective response rates. Um, the earlier we do this with Y90, the higher the objective response rates. And, and, you know, again, as a shameless plug for Y90, you know, we're getting objective response rates of 90 percent, of 90 percent in, um, in, in patients with in, in, in basically first-line failures. If you compare that to the best chemotherapeutic regimens, you know, that's still 20 to 30 percent better than them. The toxicity of Y90 relative to uh, an, an extremely aggressive chemotherapeutic regimen, there's, there's no comparison. Y90 is much easier on your patient. So we're getting an equal or better response rate with less toxicity. We, again, to me, it's a no-brainer. We need to be thinking about this sooner. But even in deep salvage, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at, uh, at response rates in the 40 to 50 percent range. And why does this matter? And again, I'm in a room full of surgeons, so you probably know this slide better than me. 
But, um, and I, hopefully the doors, I see the doors are double, so we can open them up wide, because I'm going to make your heads real big in a second. Um, but essentially, you know, I believe the only place that cancer belongs is in a bucket, right? So, you know, my role as an interventional radiologist is really as an adjunct to what, what you guys do as surgeons. And to me, what Y90 is, should provide, and, and obviously uh, uh, the folks at UPMC have really taken up um, uh, the, uh, the task here of trying to prove this in a, in a good way, um, it, that is, is that as we improve the objective response of a therapy, we drive patients to resectability. That's all this shows. So essentially, the further to the right we are on this curve, the more often those patients are getting the resection. If we go back to my second or third slide, you remember the survival rates in non-resected stage 4 cancer is 5, uh, is five to 10 percent. In patients that get resected, that survival is between 40 and 50 percent, depending on the study you look at. So simply driving more patients to resection is going to, you know, to dramatically improve the number of patients that survive at five years. That to me is the answer. But in order to make that happen, we need to move Y90 further up in, in the treatment paradigm, and we need uh, surgical buy-in from the standpoint that it's safe to do. Um, and obviously there's more work that needs to be done. Our own in-house experience at Maryland um, is that it is safe, um, but it's at the moment anecdotal. Um, so it would, be, it would be great to see more studies along these lines. That's really it. Thank you for your time.